Welcome, Welcome to, to Shenanigans Ensue with Mary San Giovanni! folks, welcome to Cosmic Shenanigans. I'm Mary San Giovanni, and we are up to a brand new year of all original shenanigans of Cosmic Proportions. I'm very excited. Today, we have a special guest, Matt Wilderson. He's from the wildly popular video game podcast, Grindcast. He's a new co-host of The Horror Show with Brian Keene, and he's the author of a new collection of Fort Shore stories called Edge of Twilight, which is on... Amazon now, right? It's yes. available on Amazon yep. now. So, everybody, welcome back. Hello. <laughs> and what we're going to do today is going to be a special two-parter with Matt. Uh, yeah. This episode and next week's episode, we are going to be talking about anything and everything horror video games that are either specifically Lovecraftian horror video games or cosmic horror survival video games. Right. Uh, we're going to talk about their strengths and weaknesses, what makes them Lovecraftian, or at least in the cosmic horror realm, which is what we usually do on the show, um, and which ones are absolute must-haves. So now what what is interesting about this is that we have, uh, between the two of us, we've played a bunch of these games, but we yep. haven't all played the same games, so it's <laughs> going to be kind of cool. Uh, the video game genre, and, and, and Matt can correct me if I'm wrong, it's had a surprisingly long and somewhat quiet history of cosmic horror video games. I, yeah. You know, I, it, it, they're, they've always been there. They've always been there, and the funny thing with video games and horror is it's just, there's, it, it feels like it pops up every now and then where horror just becomes a new popular genre for them to make games in, and then right. it just vanishes. Yes, like in waves. Yeah, because like currently right now we're in a drought. Yes. Really. Um most of anything horror is being made independently, and that also means it's not being made of high quality. Uh, most of them. There are some that shine, and that right. actually do get physical releases on the consoles, one that we'll be talking about at some point. Right. Um, but, yeah, I think horror had its heyday with video games, I would say, probably mid-90s? Early that's twos, what I'm thinking. Early yeah, thousands. early Because I think that's when I... I uh discovered Silent Hill was like the early yeah. 2000s and um, by that point it was like you know the Resident Evil the old way Resident Evil yeah that's kind of like made. Resident Evil some people consider to be the granddaddy of what got horror right. going again I mean like before that you had like Alone in the Dark which is a game we can talk about at some point but like that kind of brought it into the mainstream and then the team that made Silent Hill was just like here hold my beer <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> And then they brought the more psychological route and cosmic right. like entities into the idea, and it was just like it took off. One of the things uh, that I think is interesting that I think tends to be more of a, a blurring in video games than in literature or movies, surprisingly enough, is how many cosmic horror or Lovecraftian elements appear in games that are not. Oh yeah. By you know, by the strictest of standards, they're not uh, Lovecraftian video games or like uh, we were talking about Fallout. Uh, yeah. That there's a, a Pikmin's Arms, I think, yes. apartment in the New Vegas. Yep, and that's a callback. Yeah. And that yeah, right. And um, that uh, there is a god in Skyrim, the Elder Scrolls Skyrim game, that is very Lovecraftian. Yep. Very very uh, Lovecraftian. A lot of things that are supernatural in nature in these video games. I mean, because because. Uh, to the untrained eye, and, and compared to Matt, I am very much the untrained eye. Uh, it seems there are a lot of uh, MMO zombie type games. Yes. Where, you know, you basically you have to survive and, you know, build yourself shelter and keep yourself safe from zombies. There are games like Fallout, you know, which are like super popular. Mm -hmm. And then there are the weird supernatural monster games. And I think a lot of them use elements of Cosmic Car, but we're going to try to stick to. Ones that are very squarely yeah, more in the camp directly in, yeah. of Lovecraft. This episode is going to be specifically Lovecraftian uh, horror video games. Next episode is going to be cosmic horror video games, right. which um, use co cosmic horror elements and are definitely cosmic horror games, but not specifically in the tradition of Lovecraft with his gods and monsters and whatnot. So, yeah. 
Uh, fear of shapes. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> fear of shapes. And, and also, I think um, we can also talk about things that I didn't include on this list because I feel that they don't really qualify, even though there there is a strong leaning, like The Void. Right, yeah. Have you ever played The Void? The, the Void is a, a very much a, a dream-based, like internally-based... Uh, very surreal. Very, very. It's like a, oh. almost like the the. It's like the landscape of your mind or your soul oh. kind of place. And That's um, cool. there are a lot of what people could consider like cosmic horror elements in it. But I didn't include it on the list because one of the things that defines Lovecraftian video games is the idea that the character is almost the least important part of the game. Correct, yes. Uh, that there, and, and Lovecraft had even said that, that the whole point of his lack of character development, I guess, was that he uh, wanted to point out the insignificance of humanity in the greater scheme right. of, of, of cosmic stuff. Uh, so, just, just as a brief... Uh, overview of things that we did use, like the criteria we did use to include these games, there's always an a aspect of madness. There's always that fragile madness where one of the things you have to do in the game is to maintain a balance between uh, your sanity and the fear, the growing right. fear of something. Uh, a lot of them are generally set in the 1920s, and I get, I get why they do that. I think that if you are looking to make a video game, and, and, and you can tell me what you think about this, that it would be difficult, not impossible, but it would be a lot more work to set a Lovecraftian or cosmic horror type game in a world where technology would change the atmosphere and landscape of survival. I think you, yeah, I think you got a point there because think about now versus the twenties. <laughs> right. The twenties, uh, there was you, there was a lot of things you could just be scared about because. You just didn't know. Like, exactly. What, you know, you didn't know what was coming up in the future. Like, back in the 20s, like, you know, people throw you a birthday if you made it. You, you know, you would get, like, a Lifetime Achievement Award if you lived to 35. Right. You know, um, nowadays, things like things like horror that's meant to be more the unseen to scare you is something that I don't think people could grasp as much. Yes. Um, you know, because everybody has the mentality nowadays that I don't believe it if I don't see it. Right. In a sense. And so, there's a lot more accessibility to things. Like, there were right. a lot of things, I think, that even up until maybe the, the 80s and maybe the early 90s, people just accepted on, on faith or on gut instinct. Right, And exactly. people aren't as inclined to do that. Yeah, nowadays, you know? uh, faith is not as cemented as it was back in the 20s. Right. Um, I also that's when he wrote those stories, was the 1920s. Yeah. I also feel like putting it in a more technologically advanced age would kind of take a lot of fun out of it. Yeah. Because it was the idea of, of, like, when this stuff was going on back in the 20s, you didn't have, like, just something that could instantly fix your problem. Like a rocket launcher to yeah. shoot at Cthulhu It was just like, yeah. here's a Tommy gun, and that thing is, like, 50 stories tall. Like, right. Luck, right. Know? If it doesn't step on you... Uh... <laughs> Nowadays, it's just, oh, we'll shoot the Star Wars laser down at it, and <laughs> yeah. we'll throw a nuke and see what happens. And I think it does, I mean, especially, and we've covered this on Cosmic Shenanigans before, that um, I think that in a cultural shift like we're experiencing now, where so much of uh, political and social uh, atmosphere is really based on identity and yeah. your sense of identity, that the uh, it, it has changed cosmic horror to be more of a, a, like the characters are more proactive, there's more of a sense of redefining what... Um, it, what it you know what significance really means right in in, in a more personal or, or microcosmic kind of scale uh but also you know i i think that it's there's more of i think an acceptance of one being just like a cog in the machine prior yeah. to this you know most modern uh no, type of situation and, and, and lovecraft was was a big he was very much a a, a you know, practical, realist kind of guy. Didn't yeah. believe in in afterlife or the supernatural. So to him, this was you know, it was a very much you know, grounded in in what you know, like you said, what you could see and 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 hear and feel 
but it wasn't so much a sense of like like everybody was part of something. It wasn't yeah. It wasn't like it's not like the world exists for me. It's like I exist for the world, right? Kind of thing. So though in these games, there's also usually a sense of time running out. There's not a lot of yeah. timers, maybe, but there's always that sense that you're running out of time that you have to hurry. Yeah, which doesn't leave much in, in the way of exploring. So those mass uh, multiplayer yeah. online kind of things wouldn't necessarily no, that wouldn't work, work at all because yeah. you don't have time to dawdle. You know, you, if the stars align. You know over your head while you're, you know, checking out a bush or something, then, you know, things are going to go horribly wrong. <laughs> Punching trees trying to farm <laughs> right, some you're punching, Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, there's usually cults, right? Entities of great power and great I mean, great I think evil. they have to be cults. You have to be cults. That's <laughs> a be... checklist for these things. Oh, yeah, yeah. And all, like, the Lovecraftian games we're going to talk about, almost all of them are, um, they, they're cribbing off of the source material f far more heavily than just re regular cosmic horror stuff. One of the things I wanted to bring up with you. I want to see your thoughts on this. There's usually a lot of gore in Lovecraftian games. Yeah, there is, and it's... Which is odd. Kind of weird. Yeah, yeah because his work wasn't like no, that. No, his, his work was, you know... I, I love re reading Lovecraft, but at the same time, I feel like every now and then you need to have like a notepad next to you because you need to slowly digest yes. everything he's trying to say mm -hmm. because he, he's very articulate with the way he wrote everything. And it's, right. a, it's a thing of the, the time period too. Yes. Everything was written differently than it is now. But like, I just, I feel like you can't get that into a game as much like right. his articulate nature. So you have to, pretty it up in a sense with gore. with visuals yeah. yeah yeah i mean a lot of them are as you mentioned there in even in the the earlier ones the simpler ones there is a certain visual stunningness about yeah. a lot of these but yeah I, and, and and the thing is is that lovecraft's work it did have gore in it in some cases extreme gore but it was so subtle it was yes. like you said it was one of those things that the way he he worded things the way he crafted the prose itself it was suggested, yes. as opposed to like like people. Uh, I guess a, a, a mature enough audience, somebody who can read between the lines, would see that. Oh my God, this is this is like got rape in it, and it's got like yeah, incest and bestiality <laughs> and cannibalism and orgies. And but it wasn't expressed because it wouldn't have been polite. I get these. The no, same, you know? I have a feeling back then it wouldn't have been published either. Right. Yeah. Good point. <laughs> good point. So a lot of the but a lot of these games, I think, like you said, because it is a visual. Yeah. Medium, because you can't get into this sort of, you know, languid and, and flowery prose that they have to show it. You yes, know? exactly. Um, and again, a lot of them, a lot of them rely heavily on Lovecraftian tropes. Uh, but these are the ones that uh, between the two of us, one or the other of us or both of us have played and, and find kind of, you know, kind of indicative, I think, of the specific Lovecraftian video game genre, I guess, right. subgenre. Um, the Lurking Horror was one, if we're, if we're I, and again, I apologize, I don't have the dates when these came out, so I am probably going to be uh, talking about them out of order. It's not so much a chronological discussion of these games, um, yeah. although I had to have a vague idea that, you know, when some of these came out before the other ones, because I have old school in my notes next to them. <laughs> um, the Lurking Horror, I think, goes back to, like, those games in the 80s, where... It didn't even have um, it didn't even have the uh, pictures. Like I, I, one of my favorite games was uh, Task Times in Tone Town. I love that game. I love <laughs> that game. Uh, I still have the box and the floppy disk. Oh wow! Oh yeah, I love that. Could that could actually game. be worse. <laughs> <laughs> it was so awesome. Uh, and it had like a picture, a static picture, or like a picture where there's like one animation at like, like oh, yeah. you know, like the clock, like the, the pendulum and the, the pendulum clock was swinging, moving or yeah. something, or the dog would wag his tail. But it was mostly text based, and it was, you know, you, you got to learn like go north, go south, go east, go west, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and those games open were door. very specific with what they would take as an answer yes. or a command. Oh, yes. <laughs> and I love that because sometimes you could say like, you know, you could type in something like "screw you," and and I had a game that would say, "I'm not that kind of game." You know. <laughs> yeah. I remember I had one when I was a kid that I wrote it was something like "screw you," and so it was like, "don't know how to screw something." Oh yes. You know. Yes. It was just like oh, okay. <laughs> that was a, that was a popular fallback, or mm -hmm. um, I think one of them. I I'd say, uh, "kiss me," and it would say, "fresh." <laughs> fresh. <laughs> so it it did. There were some some where the, they programmed some funny yeah. stuff in there. The lurking horror 
was notable to me, I think, partly because I had wanted to you know, see if I could... You could find this online. I forget where it was that I found it, but you can find it and play it online. Oh, so, okay, cool. Um, it was notable to me, I think, because of the uh, the text, but because it was, in my mind, a, a, a bridge between Lovecraftian literature and a game, because it was all text-based. And because of the way it was written, somebody had really gone to great lengths to capture in words what makes a Lovecraftian story so uh, oh. mysterious and foreboding and I mean it was really kind of beautifully written it sounds really cool actually it was a lot of fun it really was for something that is like you know no pictures all text it's like all the imagery is in your head they did a beautiful job I think of capturing that sense of you know an impending doom you know running out of time uh, and and just sort of you know seeing the you, you could very clearly see the places in your head. I mean, I got lost in the forest at one point, but even then, there were <laughs> things that that in the text that uh, typified that area of the forest. So right. that eventually, I could find my way out. Like it was just, it was really kind of really well, cool. That's a good example of a text-based game. Then, yes, I know some some of them that I played growing up. It was really hard to grasp where you really were. Yes. In a physical space within the story. Right. So, I mean, that's good then that you were able to actually like visually find your way out of this forest like It was. It was very it's very visually based text and also very Lovecraftian text without being like, you know, this is beating me over the head with, you know, like you knew it was Lovecraft because they'd mentioned the Necronomicon or, you know, the the gods right. and the monsters, but without being like, oh, I've seen this 150 times. Yeah. You know? Uh so that was I think on this list that may be the oldest one. Okay. Um, and then the last door. I'm trying to think. One of them was a top-down one. I think the. I don't think the last door was. I I, I think, Mansions of Madness might Mansions have been a top-down. Mansions of top Madness down was probably one. a top-down. Yeah. Yeah, where you're you're, you're basically a little head, <laughs> <laughs> and you're going through this 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 almost like floor plan, of spaces. And I didn't honestly, I didn't finish that one. Okay. But. It is one of those ones that does have pictures. I mean, it's like 8-bit graphics, but it's so right. visually, like, so visually Lovecraft. You know what I mean? Like, well, yeah, there's certain you, colors that are always in, in Lovecraft. You can portray you know? a lot just with 8-bit graphics. It's you just can. Color palettes and just, you know, you can make a really foreboding tone, too. Oh, yeah. With a little bit of fog, you know, a little bit of pixelated yeah. fog. and On the last door, it's kind of like that, but it's a uh, first-person Oh, okay. Um, you know, so you like go to the you know cha the, the you go to the next screen and it has to load the next screen like that kind of thing. But oh man, I used to love those old kind of mm -hmm. games. Because like there's always that feeling of like while you're waiting it for like for it to load, yeah, what's going to be in there? What's going to be there? Yeah. You know. The last door I enjoyed, and that you know, but again, the, I think with these first three, what you get, I think, is is I, early early attempts to modernize. Lovecraft's work right. for a video game generation. So, and and there's something about cosmic horror. Maybe that's why there's a sort of a resurgence of it with books and movies and video games that um in some ways I think it it really it, it's a, it's an immersive kind of subgenre of horror. I mean, survival yeah. horror in general is, but I don't think people always consider Lovecraftian or cosmic horror to be survival horror but that's pretty much what it is it's yeah i think it's pretty close to it yeah i i think like it's making a resurgence now because i i kind of feel like we're having another influx of people wondering what lives beyond our stars yes you know because yes. and that seems to kind of go around cyclical as well like that was a big thing in the 50s right everybody right. was worried about aliens right and then it died down and now we're all kind of like questioning it all over again mm -hmm. with new discoveries and things that have come up so i think that's why this kind of, uh, you know, horror literature and, you know, other horror-based stuff with cosmic entities is becoming more popular once again. Right, with the string theory and the yeah. alternate dimension. I mean, the, you know, the, those kind of, the CERN kind of... Yeah, which uh, I guess we can thank Neil deGrasse Tyson. Right. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to be opening a doorway to another dimension one way or another. <laughs> uh, another one I have, and this is... The, here's an interesting uh, comparison, because I've played the online version of this, and you've played... The board game or the card game yes, is yeah. is the Elder Sign Omens. Yes, I like this game. I, I this is this is like totally like if, if Lovecraft had been a comic book 
They right. would have taken yeah. the images right out of right out of this. Yeah. You know, the, the board. I like. I can't say for the video game, but the board game itself. Like I, it was one. Of, I love the art. Yes, that was in it. Yes. Like like you said, like it's a very comic booky style kind of look. Yes, and I, like for a board game, like I feel like it captured the idea of Lovecraft very well and that it's like a hard thing to do with a board game because it's very like you have to almost picture stuff in your head right and you know but with the art that they put in it it helped a lot and it, it was just it was a really fun game I, I get the impression it's almost like playing Clue like playing yeah, like you know yeah. that there's that kind of you know if you step into the wrong room you could be screwed kind of yeah. thing yeah uh, yeah, no, the the online, the, the computer version, the video game version, is a lot, from what I can tell, it's adapted directly from the board game. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, so you have the same kind of art. It's, it's sort of card-based, which took me a while to get the hang of, because uh, yeah. the whole point is that you get to pick a person out of a list of, like, I think eight different people or nine different people, okay. something like that. And uh, each of those people has a specialty. So some of them are better with occult stuff, so that your spells will work better if you do right. occult spells. Some of them are, you know, better at finding things, or some of them are better at keeping their sanity for longer. Some of them get like a... They allow you to get an extra turn to, to make uh -huh. another move to protect yourself. And what you have to do is you have to find the monster before the monster finds you. Yeah, and I, it, it's really kind of a neat. It, it's kind of a neat setup. That's one of them I'd recommend. You can get that one on Steam. Okay, I know um, that's a good one. I think my PC should be able to run that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. Because Elder Signs Omens, I played on my old laptop before I had yeah. <laughs> even half the power that this one has, and it worked okay. Um, now you say you've played Call of Cthulhu: Dark Corners of the Earth. That's yes. not the war one, right? What's Dark Corners of the Earth is an actual like story based. Yeah, that's an actual story based within uh, the Call of Cthulhu mythos. Okay, because I know that there's a, a Call of Cthulhu game that is like turn based war kind of thing. Yes, there's that as well. But that's not this one, right? Remember, no, that's not this one. So, what's Dark Corners of the Earth like? Dark Corners of the Earth reminds me a lot of the one that was just recently put out. Um, okay, you you're in the role of a detective. Okay, there's been a murder in. Innsmouth. And, uh, nice. Who doesn't game, love Innsmouth? <laughs> yeah. Uh, the game starts out with you charging a... Well, you're not charging. You, you are assigned to go to this mansion. To uh, This is where the murder took place, essentially. And uh, you get to the gates, and the police are all under fire. There's a madman up in the mansion. He's shooting down at him. You sneak your way in there, and you know the guy has scribblings that he wrote into his body with a knife like all over the place and that's how you get introduced to that there's something really weird going on okay and okay. then you get directed to go to Innsmouth because the uh, some of the people that knew the woman that was murdered were in Innsmouth okay so you go there and right off the bat it's just the art design it, you know it's it was on the original Xbox so like nowadays it's nothing fancy right but like back then it was like it was so creepy because all the all the people in Innsmouth had that look like they were in between human and fish person. Yes, but that... it didn't completely change over yet. Right. You know? um, and you show up, and no one wants to talk to you. No mm -hmm. one wants anything to do with you. They know why you're there, but they're not letting it out completely. Right. And I believe, like for me, the first half of that game was where it's the best Lovecraftian thing you're going to have because, you know. You tr you stumble into something where you find out that the town's hiding all the information about this murder. Right. Then they just kind of blame you for it. The word gets out to all the people in the town to hunt you down. And then it kind of turns because then you start finding like the cult rooms and stuff underground. Right. And then you start getting guns, and it kind of okay. turns into a running gunner kind of shooter game. Which is like, you know, I mean, if you're into that kind of thing, it's all right. But for me, I feel like a Lovecraftian thing should be a little slower and not yes. based on just like, you know, g you know, go from Alpha to Bravo and blow everything right, <laughs> right. Of your, in your path away, you know. Well, you know, um, it's, it's funny that you mention that because I think a lot of them do that where, you know, you have this beautifully atmospheric, almost uh, metaphysical, philosophical kind of, you know, introduction you know the, almost always in these games they you know it starts with, it starts with nightmares or you have these yeah. bad dreams and you know uh and these dreams are very 
visionary, and that's from Call of Cthulhu because Cthulhu would communicate to people, artists mostly through dreams. Through and dreams, yeah. Um, but yeah, it usually goes from here's this awesome, you know, Lovecraftian cosmic horror kind of thing that devolves into having to shoot as many cultists as you can. Yeah, and you know, you're not only shooting cultists, you're shooting fishmen, right? Like the cultists that became octopus men and stuff like right. that, and. The other thing that was a little upsetting for me is Cthulhu isn't even in the game. It's Dagon. Yeah. And you yeah. kind of have, like, a giant, like... You're on a boat. I'm, not to spoil the end for anybody, but you're <laughs> you're on a boat at the end, and, like, basically Dagon's coming up out of the water and, like, attacking your boat, and you're just plugging him with whatever you got until he just goes away, right, essentially. Right, right. Because you, you can't kill him. kill him. Yeah. You know? So yeah. he just, like, gets... Enough, he gets tired of having flies in his face, and he just, like, goes back, <laughs> you know? But... And, I, I, I recommend the game if you can get your hands on it. It's a little bit rarer now to get it on the Xbox, but it, it's... I still enjoyed it for what it was. I wish it wasn't as much of just, like, shooting guns to kill whatever is in your way. Right. But... Like, more of a stealth thing, yeah. you know? And, like, I kind of wish Cthulhu was in it. Like, I get the point that mm -hmm. you're not supposed to really see him and know what right. he looks like, but... I mean, come on. Uh, you know, and that's, that's <laughs> like, about, in, in all of these, other than Elder Sign Omens, and I suspect... The newest Call of Cthulhu, which we'll talk about too. Yeah. Um, you don't ever see Cthulhu. You don't ever see most of the monsters, or at least not for a long. Or you see like avatars of them, but yeah, you, know. you see what is like a recommendation of what the thing is supposed to, you know, right. signify. But at the same time, Cthulhu, at least. Most of the games that bear his name don't really show him it, that right. Much. And I would love to see that, especially with like today's graphics. I mean, yeah. they could do such a cool, you know, even yeah. if it was just a cutaway scene of him coming up out of the water, like, that'd just be awesome. Yeah, I mean, and they show him Dagon, you know, and you're obviously fighting him, and I kind of was underwhelmed by it. Cause yeah, I was see, just and like, that shouldn't be that way. It should be something where you're, like, wowed by it, you know? Yeah, because I was like, this is the big, you know, the horror of the deep, you know, one of the gods that right. rules the ocean, and he's just... Looks like, you know, the star kiss tuna guy with <laughs> gills on the side of his face, you know? It was just kind of like, wow, right. and, uh, scary. <laughs> he's like he's like the Cthulhu's little, little or less popular brother. Yeah. Kinda, you know, when when C Cthulhu can't be bothered to be in his own game, he just sends, you he's know. He's like, hey, you, get, you, yeah, you live down here, too. Like just go tell him I'm not happy. <laughs> Shadow of the Comet is very similar. I mean, my recollection is that you, again, it, you, you know, a lot of these, you know, you, you go to a small town. The, lo the last door was the same way. You go to the small town, and they're all hiding something. And usually yeah. you can find some people who are on your side, but most of the town just wants you to go away. I do and, wish uh, that there could be a different kind of I, intro to these games yes. other than that, but... Yes. And I think it's because a lot of... But see, uh, even Lovecraft stuff, like, um, something like... You know, the terrible old man, or like Pikmin's mom. Like they, yeah, the terrible old man was in a small town, and it was just yeah. like somebody kind of just stumbles upon, like... Right. Well, I'm trying to remember correctly. Were they going in to steal? They were going in to rob him, rob, yeah. yeah. And they were going to torture him to get them the yeah. money. Yeah, and then they get in his room, and it's just like, yeah, I'm not what you think I was. Right. <laughs> right. I mean, I do like that sort of old crumbling mansion. I mean, there Which, is something to be said about that. They did that. make an indie game out of that, too. The, uh, the Terrible Old Man? Terrible Old Man, yeah. <gasps> it should oh, be on Steam. To, yeah? I'll have to go look. I think is it called The Terrible Old Man? I think so, yeah. I think it's, like, text-based as well. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, you should Those check text -based, that out. Those text-based, they're a lot of fun. I mean, I, I know people who are used to these, like, super high-end graphics and, and, and gameplay and all that. Or they might balk at the idea of a purely yeah. textual game. But there is something... I mean, a really well-done one is very... Uh, very atmospheric. It's very inspiring in a way, especially if you're a writer. I mean, you know. Yeah, that, that tickles your fancy a little bit more too. Absolutely. Uh, another one uh, is, is a two two part game. Was the Darkness Within? Okay. Um, basically, again, you're a detective, which is odd <laughs> because in in always Lovecraft, it's always a detective. In Lovecraft, there was a detective in the Cthulhu story. Um, I just feel like Detective somebody Legrasse. took that idea and just went. I just went with it. Crazy but with it, yeah. He was never a main character. He was a uh, like somebody that the main character had read about on like a third hand source or something. This detective, and I don't, to the best of my knowledge, never shows up again. Cops no. 
are rarely ever portrayed as being involved in anything in these Lovecraft stories. And when they are, they're usually sort of superstitious, I don't want to be bothered with this, I'm going to go hide kind of people. Yeah. So... Because if um, I remember correctly, in the original story, it was more like a boat crew of, like, fishermen and, like... Yeah. A captain, I think, that went to this... That went and... To the island, I guess, essentially, mm -hmm. what was Riley or whatever. Right. Um, it's been a long time since I read this. <laughs> but, yeah, like, from my recollection, it really wasn't anybody of any, like, actual authority... Right. ...that went over there. Right. The, the cop was just the guy who discovered the cult... Right, the cult during, in the woods. Like in the middle of one of their seance, well not seance, during the one of their orgy, like, orgy yeah, things. Yeah, their torture orgy thing. Um, but no, yeah, the cop is the cop is a very minor character, but it does. you did bring up a, a point, though, that a lot of these Lovecraftian games, almost all of them take place by the sea. Yeah, you know, I mean, you gotta ha I guess you kind of have to. I, I, yeah, and, and, and Which, to me, always makes me wonder, why wouldn't you start the game off with just somebody who's normal like a fisherman? Right, yeah, like a fisherman You could who... just be bringing in a different catch and things look weird. Yeah. And you're just like, why is this... Like the fish are mutating or you start getting trinkets that don't, you know... Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, that's a good point. Uh, they're almost always in these fishing towns. Mostly the main character goes to these fishing towns and doesn't think much of the the degraded... Uh... Yeah, like everybody's always kind of below him. Yes. Yeah. Uh and you the know, detectives or pirates. Are... Why don't they ever do pirates? Yeah, they could do like pirates. Like a pirate going, you know, and encountering Cthulhu. It, it's it's yeah. odd, but oh, I, yeah. a lot of Lovecraftian monsters look very aquatic, I guess. Yeah, I think that was because he had the fear of the sea, honest. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So there was a lot of the squishy, slimy, tentacled sea monster type, you know, fish I, people. I did always wonder, though, about Cthulhu having wings. Because I was like... Yeah. Not gonna help you much under the. <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> and you've never really known to fly. That's so. true. Oh wow. Well. Um, I would have liked. I would have liked to have played. I did play something that was. Now that I think about it, I may have played at the Mountains of Madness, which was a point and click. Okay, if it's, yeah, if yeah, it's yeah. The game I'm thinking of. It was a point and click, and it wasn't by the ocean. It was one of those few that was actually like. In a sort of I, snowy, that's right. icy I really kind of liked play. that story too. I guess because it was so different right. from the other ones. Right. And you know, another thing that I I think that more cosmic horror draws on this as opposed to Lovecraftian video games is uh, like the dream cycle mm -hmm. stories, that sort of surreal stuff. Which I would consider, I consider Nyarlathotep as being both. Like he yeah. was in a lot of the Cthulhu mythos stuff. But he shows up in some of the, the dream cycle stuff, too, if I'm not mistaken. Or at least things, stories that I would consider to be more in that general vein. Yeah, he kind of he kind of screws with people more in the dream sense. Yeah, than, yeah, yeah. And he was one of my favorites. I'd like to see a game based on him, because he was one of my favorite monsters. I'm trying to remember, was that the one that also had the moniker of the King in Yellow? Or was that... No, that was Haster. And Haster, that was yes. uh, one of, one of Lovecraft's like protege people that wrote, that combined them. He was like one of the them. biggest asshole ones that he wrote. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Astro yeah. Was just like I hate everyone and everything. And I don't <laughs> You're care all gonna die. Yeah. Everyone's just gonna die. It's, <laughs> I don't like anybody. Um, and then of course, I'm trying to think if we skipped any. I don't think we did. I, I the the those are the main ones that between the two of us, Matt yeah. and I have played. And, and there's then, of more course, there's, out there. But, there oh, there's yeah. tons of them. In fact, I had to narrow the list down only because I I couldn't you know I just I couldn't present all of them. Uh, yeah. The whole, th but there is the new one. Yes. Now, if you're listening to the horror show with Brian Keane, Matt and I did discuss it a little bit. I'm up to chapter nine, I believe, and okay, you finished you're it, close. right? Yes, I finished it. Okay. This game, you know, speaking of gore, this game starts out with a horribly gory. Yeah, you wake up in that cave, yeah. surrounded by eviscerated sea life. Oh yeah, it's, <laughs> like, I mean, it's you're covered really... in blood and guts, and yeah, uh, and this one too. Like, see, the thing about the darkness within, now just to go back to that one for a second, is that is maybe of all these games the most focused on going insane. Yes. Because the characters you have to interact with um, are crazy. Yes. And that, again, plays another part in Call of Cthulhu. The thing about insanity in these games is that um, I don't want to say that it's treated very heavy handedly, but I don't think people would go as crazy as quickly. One of the things I like yeah. about the new Call of Cthulhu, right, is how they handle insanity. What do you think? I mean, 
I, I like how the character. I mean, you you can decide whether or not how insane he goes. Right. I I haven't done a second playthrough to figure out if like if I make a different couple decisions right. if it matters as much, but uh, it takes the bulk of the game for him to completely lose his mind. You I know, was wondering like, about that. Yeah. It, it 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 takes a while. I mean, I will say though, once you get closer to the end, it kind of just seems to snowball at a point because it's just yeah. like he he's he's getting wise to all this stuff that's going on and he knows that there's something more because he talks to the leviathan right you right. know and that's like his first when he starts hearing him in his head and then like he sees him because you were in the jail yeah right? so when you're in the yeah. jail cell you see him you see an avatar of him i guess yeah you see like a representation of him he that that's when he's like okay there's stuff going on that I'm not going to understand and right. you know I think that's at the point where he completely breaks in the game. They don't come straight out and say it, but for me, yeah. I think that's where he completely loses it. Okay, I could see that. I could see that cuz um, I noticed that you can check one of the options to check on your your stats, I guess, is how sane you are and I jumped from okay, I was doing fine, you know, I was yeah. a little upset, I think it said, yeah. to psychotic. Yeah. I thought, well, how am I functioning if I'm psychotic, you know? Because I think you're just being pulled along like a puppet. I guess so, yeah. Um, I The the thing about the game I did not care for was uh, they, they had, like, a skill tree, which is fine. Right. But there were two areas of your skill tree which you were not able to put points in yourself. Yes, it was the occult, right? Yeah. And medicine. Which is, like, two of the areas that, while you're playing the game, you're like... I wish I could actually get better at this. Right. And the only way you could is if you had you had to find hidden objects within the mm -hmm. game as you played. And it's it's kind of one of those things where they tell you, like, oh, you'll have the best experience if you know the most occult because you'll understand everything. Right. But you're not going to find it unless you find all these hidden items. And I, I, it's an idea to get you to come and play it more than once. But okay. most people are just going to be like, I beat it, whatever. Yeah, yeah. So I feel like it was a weakness for them not to let you funnel points into that. I agree. I agree. Because it's not very being able, yeah, not and not being able to find all the occult stuff or read pages out of the Necronomicon that you eventually find, right, is kind of like a downside because yes. you're here for that. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. like so. I, I to me that was one of the more disappointing things. I, I liked the game just because of the fact that it was story driven. And you had some choices, and mm -hmm. I don't know. I I have an audiophile thing with certain stuff. Like the voice acting to me was very pleasing. Okay. I, I guess that and that kept getting me to come back in. Like the main character that you play, like his voice is just like yeah, it's like butter. Yeah, <laughs> like I could just listen to that it. guy talk. You know, he's like a little bit, you know, like a little bit gruff looking. He's a little scarred. One of the things I didn't understand. I shouldn't say I didn't understand. I, I, I perhaps didn't care for it. And this is just probably personal, because I don't drink anymore. Right. And the character's an alcoholic, which is also very common in a lot of these. Yes, These detectives are almost common. always alcoholics. Um, one of the things that affects your level of sanity is how often you drink. Right. But in a lot of these stories, if we're looking at... Uh, and this story, by the way, this new Call of Cthulhu, takes place, I believe, in 1926. It's during the time of Prohibition, so whatever yeah. that was. Because they mention in the game... They mention it a couple times. Yeah, yeah. that it's Prohibition. And, and you have several opportunities in the game to, dis, uh, to, to drink, if you want to. You can, right. have, you can have a drink. I think of the three or four that I've come across so far, I may have only taken a drink once... And it was because I thought it was the only way I was going to get the bartender I did to open the same up to thing, me. Yeah. But I opted not to drink because I, I thought did, that's what the yeah. game wanted. I thought that like I would descend into madness faster if I was a drunk. Right. So, and and also again because it's it's like in my nature now. Even even in like Skyrim when I play like if there's ale or mead or whatever, I don't drink it because I'm used to not drinking alcohol. Right. Yeah. In my real life, so. Um, I do think that, and and my understanding from reading online is that in Call of Cthulhu. Not drinking is what causes you to descend into madness because you have oh, no way of calming yourself I down. Get it. Okay, so we kind of fell for it in a sense. I guess so. Yeah, but that seems to me counterintuitive. Yeah, well, and it's also like, the, and we talked about that on the horror show is like when you take a drink or do something bad, a little icon pops up in the corner. It's like <laughs> yes. Cthulhu will remember this. Or right. <laughs> <something."> <laughs> like, like and your, just, your mother is what Santa Claus is watching yeah, you. Yeah. It's just kind of like, <laughs> well, what, like. You're, you you made it sound like I should be doing this. Right. 
And, right. then, and now they'll find out that maybe if you don't, that's what makes you lose it faster is because you're not on your crutch anymore. Yeah. Which makes sense, I guess. Yeah. But I don't know. I, I feel like with the game, they threw in some mechanics that didn't need to be in there. And I think yes. that's one of them. I think if your character wanted to drink and it's part of the actual plot, right. is that he's an alcoholic, yeah. you could have just worked that into the fabric of the game a little bit more. Right. Maybe had a couple scenes where, like, he's. He, he saw something terrible, he went on a drunken stupor, you know, and then he, right. he has a vision of all this stuff going on. I guess. You know, he, like he's being talked to then by Leviathan or something. Right. Which I think would then definitely, you know, either encourage or discourage people to follow a certain right. pathway in those choices. Uh, some of the other things, um, there are some language choices. You know, this is one of those games where you have a choice of responding to people in a certain way. Yes. Like you could be a total dick if you wanted to. Yeah. Or you could be kind of, you know... Too no like one of the things I think w that surprised me that it affects the ending, or seems to, because it's like oh, you know, so and so will remember this. Yeah, um, is whether or not you choose to tell people that their loved ones died. Yes, that's right. You know, I so I, I I don't know if it's like do they expect you to be cruel or? No, I told the person, I tell the people the yeah, truth. I told yeah, them, yeah. Um, I, I went on the path of the smooth talker. Or I tried to as much as I yeah, could. Yeah, me too. Because um, there was like that part where the cop finds you in the warehouse and he's like, yes. whoa, 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 what do we have here? And you're like, you know, the options they had. And I went with like, hey, you look like a really smart guy. Yes, We yes. should team up. You <laughs> right, know? right. I was just like, yeah, I'll smooth talk and let's see what happens. And, and then like, you know, he went with it. But that, that was like a bad choice. Right. I was, I was oh. Okay. Yeah, because I got one of those like, you know, this will be remembered. Yeah. You know, and and those, those kind of things I thought were oddly handled, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, but there, I mean, there's some parts of it I think are just, you know, just... I like, like, the, the monster that comes out of the painting. I forget what it was called. Oh, yeah. Uh, I got it wrong the last time we talked about it, too. Because um, I called it the Lurker, but it's not the Lurker. <laughs> I, you know, I, forget, I forget what it is that they call this monster, but... I don't remember it being from any of his stories. Though, no, either. no. Yeah. I think it was something that sounded like it was it was very yeah. Lovecraftian, but wasn't. And I like that it's sort of a, it's sort of a, a Pickman's model like new generation kind of idea. Yeah. You know, where this woman is a painter, painter. and you know she's painting what, what I guess what vision she's seeing. Yeah, I think she's painting what Cthulhu is telling her to paint. Yes. Because she's the artist and he's speaking to her. And she's essentially painting doorways to other dimensions, mm -hmm. which I think is an awesome concept. Yeah. It so. is. I thought it was really cool, too. Now, you, you haven't beat it. Right. Uh, I recommend you do. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> the... the Because I will say the end comes in two parts. I'm not going to ruin any of the end. Okay. You have a choice at the end. Okay. Like, your very final choice to make. And... Um, you know, the ending you get at first, the first ending you'll get is great. Um, okay. But there's like an after credits one, and that one you don't have to watch as much because I feel like it kind of unravels everything that you just did. Oh, really? Oh, no. Yeah, it's it's kind of. It was like they, they put it in there as kind of like a for you to go, oh, no, I can't believe that happened after all this. But then you sit there and think about it, and you're like, makes no sense that he would have done that. <laughs> Right, okay. So it's All one right. of those kind of things. But, yeah, I highly recommend finishing the game. Okay. Uh, since you're at Chapter 9, you don't have very far to go at all. Oh, yeah, I figured I was getting close. I because... think there's only 12 chapters, so you're very close. Okay. All right, yeah, the part, I think, the reason I put it down for a while is I got stuck on... There's a scene where you have to activate... Oh, the glyphs. Yeah, the glyphs. And yeah, they that was kind of circle before. That was kind of a weak part of the game. Uh, yeah. Your characters don't run very much, and right. this thing can chase you at like fifty miles an hour. So yeah, it's, it's 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 you know it's kind of like a turtle trying to outrun a, a cheetah. And know? they did put in areas where there's stealth, and I kind of wish they didn't do that. Like when you're in the asylum, and you have to like, yes. keep away from like the guards, and it was just like yes. these guards if they if they spot you, even if you go hide somewhere they in another room down the corner, they'd come straight to you. Yes. I found that you. annoying. Especially because yeah. you can't fight it off. There's nothting you no, can do No, you can't do they anything. You. They just find you and you can't even yeah. push them or nothing. It's yeah. just resets. I never had patience for that. That's one of the one of the reasons why I think because uh, you know, I've been talking to Brian Keane about, you know, he plays Fallout and you can approach the game in a, in a couple of different ways. You can yes. either do like stealth or you can do uh, you could be the kind of person that goes in like guns blazing or whatever, and I've never been good with being patient enough to do stealth like sniper right. stuff. You know, um, even in Skyrim, I've been playing that, and 
I always love bow and arrow, but I don't have the patience to learn it because you have to, it's like a, you know, picking people off from far away kind of thing. Right, right. Now I have a two-handed sword and I just go and chop the hell out of everything. <laughs> I mean, and I like magic, so I, I've also taken to, you know, shooting people with lightning and, and fire. Oh, and, yeah, you got to do know. the magic in that game. Well, and, you know, and that, which brings me back to the, the, the Lovecraft stuff is that these people are seldom ever given any kind of agency to do occult magic, which is how right. the only way that anybody in a Lovecraft story ever got any of these monsters to go away. Right. <laughs> you know, true. I'd almost like to see like a like a professor of Miskatonic University, you know, being this guy that, you yeah, know. Yeah, I mean, like you kind of get a professor character in the recent game, but he's just, he's, he's not really dick. of Miskatonic yeah. University. Right? He's just like, I've got a hunch. Right. You know, because yeah. this, it only makes sense if it would be like this, you know, and it's like, okay, well, plus you don't like me for no reason at all. Right. He's and, kind of a dick. Yeah. And yeah. your mouth is huge. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like gonna, his character model guy. was weird. He's the guy who keeps sending me out to do all these glyphs. And while he stays in the protective circle and mutters yeah. his words, like, no, no, teach me the words and you go run out and, yeah. and activate all the glyphs. I'm your main character, damn I'm it. I'm the painter he's speaking to, exactly. after all. Exactly. <laughs> so, okay, so that, basically, those are our Lovecraftian games. Next week, we are going to be talking about some cosmic horror games, which don't you don't use the mythos of Lovecraft, but definitely use elements of cosmic horror. And we'll be talking about why we feel that these are, you know, good cosmic horror uh video games, why they fall into that category. Yep. So if you enjoy Cosmic Shenanigans, you might also enjoy another show I co-host, The Horror Show with Brian Keene, which Matt also co-hosts. Yay! Uh, both of them are available on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, I think maybe still iHeartRadio, I'm not sure, and all of the platforms <laughs> via the Project Entertainment Network for free, as always, for free. Uh, you can pick up Matt's book at uh, The Edge of Twilight yes. on Amazon, and uh, you can pre-order my new one, which is Inside the Asylum. That's also on Amazon. Uh, as always, thanks to engineer Dave Thomas, who is in all his splendor first glory on the couch next to us. You can watch his <laughs> channel most nights at twitch.tv slash meteor notes. And we will be back next week with more video games. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Bye. guys. See ya. Design. It's Bazong, the Bizarre and Weird Fiction Podcast. Hosted by me, Mr. Frank. Bazong is the showcase podcast of the Bizarro Fiction genre. And those who write weird and read weird are going to love this podcast, where each week we talk to everyone who is anyone in the Bizarre and Weird Fiction realm. So join us here every Monday, presented exclusively by Project Entertainment Network. Yeah. <laughs>